So welcome everyone. Uh, today, um, our agenda is to take a deep dive into OFDMA. Our chief scientist, Steve Shear has some really good material to explain how and why OFDMA works and, and when it's best to use. Uh, Steve has uh, over 20 years of experience in Wi-Fi directly, most recently with the Wi-Fi Alliance, but prior to that with uh, other wireless technologies, uh, including uh, GSM, TDMA, CDMA, and he's been involved in several standards, uh, important standards efforts, uh, in addition to the Wi-Fi Alliance certification. And uh, Prachi Samkuar is our systems engineer. Uh, both Steve and Prachi are based in the Bay Area in California, where they work with customers directly and with the Octobox system, configuring and running tests. And uh, Prachi has experience with Intel uh, prior to Octoscope. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna let Steve uh, take things over. And uh, the rules of engagement today are, we are obviously making eff the effort to come to you live. We're doing this tutorial three times a day uh, to reach all the time zones. Um, and so we do welcome direct questions. Uh, feel free to post your questions in the Q&A or raise your hand so you can ask them live. We're gonna try to stop at the end of each slide or every couple of slides so give us a little time and we'll get to your question. And with that, we're ready to go. Thank you, Fanny. Um, I, thank you everyone for uh, joining to listen in. Um, <clears throat> just as an introduction, I wanna point out that Wi-Fi 6 testing is uh, really a departure from previous generations of Wi-Fi. Um, in the beginning, we had uh, 802.11b that evolved through A and G, later through 11n, which was known as high throughput um, Wi-Fi 4. 11ac uh, came in as very high throughput or Wi-Fi 5. Um, and even the new 802.11be is known as um, extremely high throughput. So all these previous generations have been uh, focused on giving higher and higher throughput to individual users. 11AX is different in a sense in so far as it focuses on high efficiency uh, for a network, not just increases in throughput. Um, this is important for dense environments like, uh, like airports and sports stadiums and these kinds of things. So when we think about um, uh, testing Wi-Fi 6, we should uh, make sure to, uh, to exercise uh, um, those, uh, uh, those, those parameters. Today, we're gonna to focus on two key uh, Wi-Fi features, MU-MIMO um, and OFDMA. And these are uh, important aspects that improve uh, efficiency of the spectrum especially as I mentioned in uh, dense environments. Before we go on, um, I'll just touch on the new MCS values that Wi-Fi 6 uh, brings in. Um, Wi-Fi 5 was uh, 256 quam. Uh, Wi-Fi 6 brings in 1024 quam. So that's quite a dense constellation. It allows you to convey basically more bits per second. And that together with the 160 megahertz bandwidth really more than doubles the available throughput. So this is um, also a significant benefit of, uh, of uh, 11AX. <clears throat> so these uh, efficiencies uh, that we talked about are gained really in two, um, in two key ways. MU-MIMO, uh, increases the capacity um, by creating simultaneous uh, full capacity physical layers. And it does that through, uh, through beam forming, as you can see um, in the diagram on the side. It currently only operates in downlink direction, 
um, but Wi-Fi 6 uh, R2 will have that working in, uh, in Uplink. OFDMA uh, increases efficiency um, by allowing up to 37 users to be on the air simultaneously. And this has a huge benefit in reducing overhead for each frame. We'll take a look at that in a little bit more detail later on. OFDMA works in uh, both the downlink and the uplink directions. <clears throat> so it's, uh, it's pretty much um, a, a fully fledged in, in R1. We'll take a little step back um, in history. Um, we've always had frequency division, multiple access. This is a conventional frequency scheme. It allows different users uh, um, to have uh, different services, and they do that by allocating different channels. Um, orthogonal uh, frequency division, multiple access, is, uh, is much more efficient than the traditional FDMA uh, because these uh, subcarriers are, uh, are orthogonal and they don't require guard bands, which is, uh, is, is a waste of spectrum. Um, the other interesting thing about this is that, unlike uh, FDMA, these individual carry, uh, carriers can be allocated dynamically. So one can allocate uh, a number of carriers to, uh, to a particular device, depending on its data rate requirements uh, um, and so on. So this is done on a dynamic uh, basis and uh, results in, in a very efficient system. An important aspect though um, about, uh, about OFDM is uh, that these uh, carriers must be orthogonal. So by orthogonal, what we mean is that adjacent carriers do not interfere uh, with one another. And if you take a look at the, um, at, at the response there, you'll see it goes through zero um, uh, right exactly where the, each adjacent uh, carrier is. Um, this allows us to, uh, to uh, you know, optimally um, space these carriers and make use of the frequency domain a bit more effectively. Um, I'm, uh, so on, on the right is um, a, a diagram uh, just, uh, just pulling out that particular aspect. Um, in, uh, in OFDMA, we have multiple independent stations that are uh, transmitting simultaneously. And they need to make sure um, that, they've, uh, that they've got phase lock um, so that th their tones are orthogonal with tones from other devices participating in the OFDMA exchange. If that, if that is not an accurate phase lock, these tones can, can move across like this, and you can see they generate interference um, in, in the adjacent tone. It's a very important aspect um, of, uh, of maintaining uh, accurate phase lock and, um, and frequency as well. Um, basic principles of OFDMA. Um, each user is given an association identifier. Um, there's the usual preamble, uh, w which we see uh, as a standard part of Wi Fi, it uses the full bandwidth of the channel. Um, the difference is that the payload for each user or each AID is sent in different portions of the spectrum. And these portions of spectrum are called uh, resource units. So the allocation of uh, AIDs uh, to resource units or resource units to AIDs um, is done on a packet by packet basis. It's very dynamic um, and it makes um, studying uh, the OF OFDMA uh, performance quite interesting. A key 
part of OFDMA is the trigger frame. The trigger frame is uh, sent by the AP. Um, it contains information about which participating devices uh, are going to uh, participate in that particular uh, um, uh, frame. Um, and it provides um, a, 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 it provides a, a time, a frequency, um, and a power reference for the devices. In this case, that would be doing um, uplink OFDMA. Um, there are very stringent uh, requirements on the timing of devices to respond. Ideally, they should all respond simultaneously. Um, so there is a tolerance allowance of plus or minus 400 nanoseconds uh, that they have to meet. And this is actually tested um, uh, by Wi-Fi Alliance in their certification uh, program. They also have to maintain very accurate uh, carrier frequency offset, um, plus or minus 370 hertz, which is very stringent indeed. Um, and together with that, they need to control their transmit power to uh, facilitate uh, proper uh, AGC operation um, at the AP receiver. So quite a lot of detail, um, uh, performance re related stuff um, that OFDMA brings into the mix. I'm going to look uh, at some of the efficiency gains that we talked about for OFDMA. Um, the top diagram um, uh, depicts, uh, um, depicts what happens when we're sending, for instance, small voice packets that just are not able to fill the, com the, you know, the complete 160 megahertz channel capacity. There's a lot of overhead leading up to the actual useful information uh, contention period, uh, RTS and CTS and preambles and stuff. Um, and if you just take a look at the ratio of the amount of useful information to, uh, to overhead, again, especially for short packets, uh, you can see this is uh, legacy Wi-Fi is, um, uh, can be uh, quite inefficient. Um, <clears throat> OFDMA, um, essentially squeezes each uh, user's data in frequency and it stretches it out in time. Um, what that means is that the whole protocol exchange becomes much more efficient because the ratio of the actual useful data um, uh, uh, to the rest of the overhead is, is minimized as well. But another important aspect here is that um, in the in the upper uh, in the in in the legacy um, uh, uh, system, uh, you have to do a contention a channel contention for every single packet that you send. With OFDMA, we're packing in this case nine users uh, into this packet, and we only have to do one channel contention in order to get the data to those nine users. So just intuitively, you can see there's a great gain um, in efficiency there. I didn't draw a diagram for 37 users, but uh, one can, uh, the standard allows packing 37 different users uh, simultaneously into the 80, 80 megahertz band, um, and indeed 72 um, in the in, in 160 megahertz bandwidth. So this is, a, this is a depiction. These are drawn roughly to scale um, and gives one a, an idea of, of the benefit in, uh, in efficiency there. So let's think a little bit about testing uh, considerations. Um, we've, uh, we've spoken about the need for many devices. That's what Wi-Fi 6 is, to, is designed for. We should really be testing uh, these new features um, in, in the way that, that they were designed. So uh, we have a thing we call the PAL box. This contains um, 16 individual stay PALs. These are uh, 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 um, physically individual stay PALs. They will 
run on a, a Pico ATX um, board. We make use of the Intel AX200 receiver. Um, and we have different flavors of, of Linux and, and Windows. We also group them in um, group, uh, four groups of four. Uh, these are two by two stations. And we feed, the, uh, uh, we feed the signals into the corners of the testing chamber. This gives us uh, the maximum um, spatial diversity for each of these groups means we can test mu mino in this chamber and that uh, that works very effectively but again <clears throat> with the number of of, uh, of stations here we can very effectively test ofdma as well these are some of our pals um our pals are test instruments um the stay pal is the little guy um, up on the top right there with the two antennas. Uh, as I mentioned, it is, it, it is a, a standalone um, a, a station with its own computing power um, inside it. And we pack 16 of these into a PAL box. Makes for um, a great deal of parallel processing um, in that box. <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> it also contains a PAL 6 as well. You can see the stack here um, with the PAL box door open, uh, cram uh, packed with these, uh, uh, with these. So we talked about the antennas coming into the corners of the chamber. This is an important aspect um, uh, to get spatial diversity. And this is a kind of close up of these antennas. We use these high gain antennas because we found them are uh, very effective um, for doing MU MIMO. It's, a, it's an excellent way to couple um, to the device under test with as little loss as possible. Um, and for devices that don't have um, antenna connectors and so on, we, this is a very, uh, a very practical way of doing things. Let's uh, take a quick look at MU MIMO. Um, MU MIMO, uh, sorry, uh, single user MIMO can really only service one user at a time. This is kind of the, the legacy uh, Wi Fi that we understand uh, where uh, one device is, uh, is um, serviced at a time, essentially, time sharing the channel. And that limits the um, uh, limits the amount of uh, traffic that you can get to each device. Um, in the case of MU MIMO, um, it effectively creates um, uh, uh, um, uh, in individual phis by using beamforming, and this can simultaneously serve each of these separate, uh, spatially separated users. Um, so this uh, gives us actually a much higher aggregate throughput for the network. And just as an example, um, if we had three MU MIMO users, um, we'll get nearly three times the aggregated throughput. So a very effective feature of uh, Wi-Fi 6. Um, I'm going to run a demo of MU MIMO, uh, Wi Fi 6 MU MIMO. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to select uh, two PALs uh, from uh, opposite corners of the box, um, and we're going to run uh, MU MIMO traffic. Uh, we'll start off with uh, in, uh, in single user mode, um, and then we will we will switch that uh, uh, switch that that on. Let me just um, pull this up here. So we have a no number of traffic pairs um, on the left hand side. Um, I'm going to uh, I'm going to start the uh, experiment running. Um, 
So here we see um, the, uh, the throughput for each user, the red and the green uh, user. They're getting approximately the same, uh, the same throughput. Um, the aggregate throughput's up around about 900 or so. And this, this, is, uh, this is typical for, uh, for, for, for single user miner. Um, <clears throat> we're running uh, at, uh, at MCS 10 at this point. And, um, and our data rate is, is, uh, um, is, a, is a little over a thousand megabits per second. So I'm going to go ahead now and um, switch MU Mino on. We can do that in this configuration screen. So here I'm switching this guy on. I'm going to send that configuration down to the PAL 6, which um, will go offline as it reconfigures itself. You can see the data has um, stopped there. And I can monitor the status of the PAL 6 with this little hover over window. So this will take uh, a few more seconds. <clears throat> Before it comes back on, there we go. That started to come online. We can see the uh, stays associating. Um, we'll give it uh, a little bit of time just to stabilize. This is a, a, a fairly disruptive event. Okay, so uh, stays are still associating, um, and I'm waiting for the green guy to associate. So um, you can see the red one is um, is making use of the uh, the full uh, uh, full use of the channel. Ah, here comes the green guy. So um, now we see that uh, both the red um, uh, and and the green are getting higher throughput than they did before. And the overall aggregate throughput is higher as well. I'm going to leave it just to run for a few more seconds. Um, there, uh, there are some training sequences and so on that are going on to try to optimize this. Um, so this is... Um, yeah. It, so this is good. Yeah, uh, so you can see the MU MIMO gains with two stations. Uh, there may be decreasing gains with more stations, but with two, you will get optimum gain. Uh, so um, there is a question. There was a question why we have Linux and Windows state pals. And the reason is our customers want to see both because drivers are different, OSs are different, uh, TCP, UDP stacks don't perform the same way. In fact, we see a lot of differences in performance. So, so we have mixed them up. There's another question. Uh, can you observe similar MU MIMO total throughput with four by four router or eight by eight? Is, is eight by eight required for spatial, spatial diversity? So that's a good question. Uh, it, theoretically, you can form a better beam with eight antennas versus four. Um, we, in practice, we have not seen a uh, good performance with the 8x8 devices that are available. Uh, and we are using 4x4 here. But it's a good question because ideally you've got more antennas to form a better beam. Right? But we're using 4x4 here and two 2x2 two two stations. Okay, thank you, Fanny. Um, so we're going to uh, move on, and I'm going to show you uh, an OFDMA demo. So here we're running with um, eight stations uh, in the PAL box. Um, we've disabled um, MU MIMO operation. Again, we're running two stream uh, state PALs um, on, on a Linux OS. Um, and we're going to be looking at, <clears throat> um, at ping latency. So here you see the, um, uh, the, uh, the eight 
uh, traffic pairs. Uh, we have a large number of devices associated. I'm going to get this running. Um, it'll take a little time to load. Okay, here we go. Um, so we're looking at the graph of uh, ping latency down in the bottom here. Um, this is with um, OFDMA off. Um, and you can see this. Uh, uh, there's a fair, a fair amount of latency. There is a big spike there, but uh, mo most of the latency is around 100 milliseconds or, or in that order. Um, at this point, I'm going to uh, reconfigure our um, PAL-6, and I'm going to switch OFDMA uh, on. Just like before, we're, uh, we're going to send the configuration down. The um, PAL-6 has gone offline, and the data traffic has stopped. So we'll give it a, um, uh, a few seconds for it to reconfigure itself. So this is coming back up again now. Um, the stays are uh, all associating. It's still a few more to go, I think. Um, and the data has uh, started running. So. Now I want to draw your attention to the latency um, in the graph down below and notice how considerably uh, reduced it is. So uh, I'm going to switch off this graph here, which will allow us to rescale the graph. So here on the left-hand side is the ping latency with um, um, uh, with OFDMA off, and on the right-hand side is ping latency for all of those eight stays, but this time with OFDMA on. A uh, couple of spikes. I think these are uh, due to the you know the transition and and stuff queuing up and so on, but um, these are all very very closely grouped together, and if you zoomed in there, it would be. Uh, uh, below the 10 millisecond range, whereas previously we were looking, you know, 60 to, to, uh, to 100. Now I'm going to uh, hand over to my colleague Prachi, who is going to show us um, a Wi Fi 6 throughput demo. Uh, so this one is a classic uh, rate versus range test, which I'm going to show you. Uh, so I'm just going to dive into it directly. All right. Okay. So here, I, what I'm doing is I'm running a, my traffic from the AP to one of the stay pass. So you can see uh, with Wi-Fi 6, you're achieving theoretical performance. We are getting a throughput of around uh, 2 gig. And um, one of the benefits of using our stay pass is we can see uh, a number of uh, underlying metrics. So on the graph here, you can see that we are uh, we are able to see at the RSSI, uh, that, that is the data RSSI per chain. Uh, we are getting a data rate of around uh, 2,400. Um, we are running an MCS of 11. Uh, again, as I mentioned, um, the Staypal is a two stream device and we are operating at 160 megahertz. So, and this one is we are running at an adapt, uh, adapting MCS. Uh, if you guys want, uh, we can run it as a fixed MCS too. And on the left here, you can see that we are simulating range by using attenuate, attenuate, attenuators. And as soon as, uh, as, as soon as the attenuators increases, you can see a drop in the RSSI here on the graph and a corresponding graph uh, and a corresponding drop on the throughput also. So this is um, this shows us uh, the performance of Wi-Fi six. And if you guys have any questions, please feel feel free to ask. All right, nice uh, test. Thank you, Prachi. Yep. So we have a question: Is there any difference in the stay in blue color versus red? I think you may be referring to that diagram. The blue was Windows and red was Linux. So we do have a mix of Windows and Linux. Stay power. Oh, okay. Stay power, okay. 
Misty, if we can go ahead. Okay, thank you. Let me try to get this up and running again. Okay, so um, as you saw from Pranchi's demo, um, there's an enormous amount of data that we collect. Um, I mentioned that we store this um, in a Mongo database. Uh, we can extract it and look at it later. We can post-process it. Um, um, a, a, a lot of interesting information um, is captured in there. Um, but I'd uh, like you to give some thought about what all that information looks like when we have 37 simultaneous devices. Um, even the analysis of that information in a Wireshark uh, screen becomes uh, very, very complicated. There, there's a tremendous amount of data. And to try and get some sense of how your OFDMA um, system is performing is very tiresome to, uh, to look at the, at, at, at the detail in Wireshark. I mean, that is a necessary thing to do, um, for, especially for debugging. But sometimes it's useful to get a kind of a big picture um, uh, idea of how, how the uh, device is performing. So let's just remind ourselves uh, the, uh, the diagram on the left is the legacy Wi-Fi spectrum. Um, uh, single user, at, you know, one user at a time. Uh, the diagram on the right depicts um, the, an, an OFDMA where we have multiple users um, in the same packet. Um, and, um, uh, and it very quickly becomes apparent that we need new methods to visualize its performance. Um, otherwise, uh, we, we, it, otherwise we, um, it's very difficult to get the big picture. So we've actually um, uh, uh, represented this information in a 3D plot here. Um, this is actually a plot using a, a commercial AP. Um, there are 20, 24 state pals participating. Uh, we've actually got seven uh, cell phones in there as well. And that's a total of 31 unique um, AIDs. We differentiate the AIDs by color. We can uh, look along the time axis. We can see the RUs that are allocated in the frequency axis. Um, and since, just to add further complication, uh, each AID uh, is a, can be assigned a different MCS. So we take a look at the MCS uh, for each one of these allocations in the Z axis. So this is one picture here. You can see a mixture of wide and narrow um, um, RUs. You see a mixture of higher and lower MCSs. This is another one, um, same AP. Uh, we're actually running in, um, uh, in 20 megahertz bandwidth. Um, these are actually very small uh, packets to simulate voice. Um, and you can see um, you can see the really the distinct sort of difference in characteristic of these two graphs. Um, one, this one is doing voice. This guy is just basically doing, uh, you know, like a, like a throughput test. Um, in the voice packets, nearly all of these are, are narrow RUs. Um, and it's very useful to have this sort of helicopter view of that. Um, now, to extract uh, information in, in OFDMA, uh, you need to assign uh, a sniffer per AID. And this is where the PAL box um, uh, really springs into its own, because you can assign uh, one of these state panels um, as a sniffer uh, to, to monitor uh, uh, its own or to monitor a particular endpoint. So we can set up a number of sniffer, uh, a number of OFDMA sniffers, um, and a number of endpoints, and we can get a very good picture 
um, of uh, what's happening in this both DNA system. Of course, these sniffer probes, we call them, um, need to be synchronized. Um, and so we, we use the term synchro sniffer um, probes for, for OFDMA. Um, so next time we'll dive into this very interesting topic, uh, the topic of synchro sniffing uh, for OFDMA. Um, and roaming as well. In fact, there are a number of other scenarios where uh, synchro sniffing um, is important. Of course, this requires all of our probes to be synchronized, and we have a method for doing that. Uh, we'll be discussing that in more detail um, in the next tutorial session. So I think we have a few minutes left over, and I'd be very happy to try and answer any questions if you have them. Yeah, there is one question. Um, can I test TWT and BSS coloring using staples? And the answer is yes, uh, we can. We may be showing a show, uh, some tutorial on that uh, down the road. Uh, so as far as TWT, we ourselves have not tested it. We've tried uh, Intel AX200 driver appears to be broken in some ways, and so we're still not getting TWT with any stations that we have. Um, and, but we, we, we do have uh, the capability and it's enabled in our PAL-6. Uh, so Staples uh, waiting for it to be fixed. That's, that's the answer. But the test bed does support these tests, and we plan to do them both. The coloring is a different test, so that's also coming. And the test bed is, is we'll, we'll support it. We have a specific uh, signal flow of, the, of um, the traffic for it uh, with the adjacent overlapping uh, BSSs uh, for coloring. Thank you, good question. And any other questions? So I, I am based um, in the Bay Area. Um, hopefully things are gonna get back to normal um, and you'd be welcome to come and visit our facility there. Um, but in the meantime, um, if you have a particular topic that you'd like us to cover something of uh, interest to you, please feel free to, uh, to drop me an email directly um, and we'll see what we can put together to, uh, 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 to cover that for you. There is another question, uh, Steve, you may be able to answer. How is the participation in the uplink of the mainframe negotiated? Is there an exchange required? Oh yes, right. Um, uh, it, that that is that's a good question, and it's um it's a very important aspect of uh, of OFDMA. So I'll take you back to this um uh, to this diagram here. The 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 it's not really uh, a negotiation as such, um, although one could think of it a little bit in those terms. The trigger frame that the AP sends down contains it, in it information about who the access point, which stays the access point wants to hear from. So that's, that's where it basically lays it out. Um, and if you take a look at a trigger frame, uh, you will find the individual uh, AIDs actually listed uh, in that. So that's the, that's the um, uh, dare I say, uh, trigger. <laughs> that uh, that controls um, the transaction. Okay, there's another related question, so stay there. Um, is uplink of DMA in uplink of DMA? Does each stay send its own preamble? So the answer is yes, but there is also a common legacy preamble, which is on a previous slide, I think. But you can see on this slide, once the O of DMA is all negotiated, then each stay sends its own O of DMA preamble. But prior to that, you have a legacy preamble which participates in all the CSMACA uh, stuff. So I think you have that on the previous slide, Steve. 
Yes. So see that preamble, that's a legacy preamble. But once you have stations jump in and there are used, they also have uh, of DMA preamble. All right, folks. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we're delighted that you joined us. Uh, and um, we look forward to hearing from you if you have any further questions or would like to come and play with the gear. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for listening. Okay, bye-bye, everybody.